Wilson Center is devoted, the mission of the Wilson Center is to bring scholars and policymakers together. And there are many, many important issues being debated in Washington these days, but certainly higher education is right up there. Higher education is a crucial subject in thinking about America keeping its competitive edge, its uh, ability to be innovative and flexible and nimble and all that. Um, and there are lots of debates among people in various quarters here in DC about what kind of education is best to uh, make that happen. And I think there's probably uh, no greater testament to the fact, to the value of liberal arts education in making that kind of thing happen than the fact that people like Jane Harmon, who went to Smith College, or me, who went to Barnard College, or any number of other people in this center and in this room and, and all around DC and, and in the uh, higher echelons of leadership all over the country. Um, the percentage of, of, of students who go to liberal arts college is under 2%, is that right? But the percentages in all different walks of life in the higher uh, ranks of leadership in, in all different walks of life is well beyond that. 6%, 10% of college presidents, of people, CEOs. Um, I'm sure Vic will be covering some of these in his, uh, in his pr presentation. So we're very pleased to be able, so when I saw this book, uh, Liberal Arts at the Brink on, in the Harvard catalog last uh, fall, I said, and we've been thinking about higher education here. We've had a number of other events on higher education, uh, but none that had really addressed this particular issue. And when I saw this book on the list, I immediately got in touch with Dr. Farrell and asked him if he would come and uh, allow us to discuss his book, and he graciously agreed. And so today's panel is the result of that. So we have with us today not only Victor Farrell, who is the author of this book, but two very fine experts who will help uh, discuss it and talk and to bring out some of the issues that are involved. Um, following Victor, Farrell, uh, Victor Farrell's presentation, we'll have Scott Jasek, who is the editor and co-founder of the online publication Inside Higher Ed, which has been online now for six years. Um, Mr. Jasek was previously the editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was, of course, the classic publication in that field, but I think he's, in the last six years, he's turned Inside Higher Ed into the go-to place for news about education and important analysis and understanding of what of the issues that are uh, going on in that. And also commenting on the book, we have, we're very pleased to have with us Francis Oakley, who, um, like uh, Dr. Farrell, is a president emeritus, in this case, of Williams College, uh, where he's taught for, where he served, where he taught for many <coughs> years and served as president from 1985 to 1994, and he himself is a respected and well-known scholar in the field of medieval history. Dr. Farrell started out life at, no, you're not Dr. Farrell, are you? Are you I am now. You I are now, okay, you are now. I <laughs> uh, started out life as a lawyer, and then he became a, a higher, an administrator of higher education. So we have three wonderful experts, very knowledgeable, and a wonderful book to discuss, so I will turn the floor over to Dr. Farrell, who will have about 30 minutes to present the book, and then each of the commentators will have 15 minutes for their remarks, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Sonia. It's, it's, it's for someone who practiced law, law in Washington for 30 years, being called a scholar and doctor is very satisfying. <laughs> I only wish all my former partners were here to, to, uh, to learn about this. Uh, liberal Arts at the Brink um, is about what's happening to undergraduate education in this country at the 20, 225 leading liberal arts colleges in America. And uh, if, you, if you look at the list, uh, it'll begin with every liberal arts college you know, but when you get halfway through, you start, you run very quickly to, to schools you don't know. And the reason it doesn't include universities, which also offer liberal arts education, is because they're such complex entities that offer so many services and kinds of education that it's hard to sort out uh, the, the parts of it that are liberal arts education, undergraduate education only, uh, but the uh, conclusions in the book apply uh, generally to liberal arts. Uh, I want to talk about four questions briefly. I think I can do it in less than 30 minutes. First, what's happening to undergraduate liberal education? Second, why it's happening? Third, whether we should care, if at all? And fourth, whether anything can be done if we do care. All right. First, what's happening? College students in increasing numbers are turning away from liberal arts education and turning towards directly career-related vocational courses of study in growing numbers. You can uh, get a bachelor's degree now in apparel design at Texas Tech, in addiction studies at Kansas Wesleyan, in paper and pulp science at Miami University, in court reporting, I like that one, in a, a, a 
bachelor's degree in court reporting at the University of Mississippi, or a bachelor's degree in casino management. Care to guess where? <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> Florida State University. <laughs> Not UNLV. <laughs> I, I met a, uh, during the course of writing this book, I met a 17-year-old a boy who was going to college, and his ambition in life is to become a computer game designer, which seemed to me preeminently sensible for a 17-year-old boy. And by golly, he found several universities that offered a bachelor's degree in computer game design. Between 1987 and 2008 at the 225 private liberal, arts, private liberal arts colleges I looked at, the percentage of graduates with vocational majors increased from 10 to 30 percent. The number of colleges graduating 90 percent or more liberal arts majors dropped by half, more than half actually. And the number graduating 30 percent or more vocational majors quadrupled from nearly 30 to 111. Did Is that Mike Madonna? Closer? Okay. Indeed, indeed, in 2008, 51 of the 225 colleges graduated 50% or more career-related vocational majors. And even at the 50 wealthiest colleges, Wells, uh, uh, Williams, Amherst, and the like, uh, the percentage of vocational majors increased during that period from 4 to 10%. The declining demand for liberal arts has already forced some liberal arts colleges to close their door, doors, and others have sold out to for-profit schools. Most have survived. I see. Okay. What do you think now? Is that working? Okay. Should I start over? <laughs> um, most most have uh, most liberal arts colleges have survived, but at the price of replacing liberal arts with vocational training. Now, let me just uh, uh, give a brief aside on for-profit colleges. These, the, these are the schools you see advertised on television all the time. Indeed, one of them sponsored one of the bowl games on, uh, on, the, on the first of the year, which is, I thought was impressive. Uh, they offer almost exclusively vocational courses, and the reason they do this is because of what the students want, and like many like indeed most commercial ventures, they try to give their customers what they want. Um, they generally only offer liberal arts courses if they have to in order to be accredited. And the reason they want to be accredited is so that they, they have to do that to get federal money. Between 80 and 90 percent of most for-profit universities' revenues come from the federal government. In 2009, they received $26.5 billion in federal money, and that was a 600% increase over 2000. And in, 2000, in the five years between 2005 and 2010, the number of for-profits rose from 909 to 1,215, a 37% increase. Their enrollment went up from 900,000 to a million nine, a 110% increase. And the number of private, not-for-profit, colleges and universities declined 2%. Well, why is this happening? Why is the demand for liberal arts education falling? Um, there's always been a demand for, for college degree, but there's never been that much demand for liberal arts education. When, when Henry Adams went to Harvard in 1854, when Harvard was still a liberal arts college, incidentally, he said that the reason he went there was it was just the next regular step after graduating from secondary school, actually from Mr. Mr. Dixwell's school on Boylston Street. He added, the advantages of going were chiefly social rather than mental. Now, my family didn't have the Adams wealth, but my, both my parents went to uh, college, and, it, and going to college was just the next regular step for me, as I suspect it was for a good number of people uh, in this room. Uh, the the The... We, we may have gotten a liberal education while we were at college or started to get one, but that isn't the reason. That isn't what we were after when we went there for the most of us. In the early 1960s, colleges opened up their doors to students for whom it was not the next regular step. And they came in rapidly growing numbers. Between 1955 and 1970, undergraduate enrollment in this country increased from 2.5 million to 7.5 million 
just a staggering increase. And many of them were first generation collegians and encouraged by their nervous parents, these new students were motivated to get a better job and to increase their earning potential. I, I think that the single most dramatic change in higher education, certainly in my lifetime, and, and I think generally, is the opening, opening of higher education for those for whom it was not just the next regular step. Um, careerism, the pursuit of a college degree for the focused purpose of preparing for a particular career, is now the collegiate norm. It has become the next regular step. In a 2007 UCLA survey of entering first year students, 90% said that preparing for a career was very important. 8% said the availability of a liberal arts education was essential in choosing a college. Um, between 2000 and 2007, the number of entering first year collegians who were undecided about the career they wished to pursue dropped from 21 to 6% undecided. High school counselors, as some of you may know, now routinely advise students to choose the career they want to pursue before selecting a college because how would you know which college will give you what you really need? Career nights at junior high schools are commonplace. I mean, I just, that, that knocked me over when I heard that. And, and, and the federal government's in this too. Both this administration, Jane, and the previous administration strongly champ championed increasing collegians, but for the purpose not of, of, of preparing uh, thoughtful citizens, but rather a trained workforce. The old saw that I heard and most of you heard, I think, when you went to college, don't even think about what you want to major in, let alone what you want to have as a career, until after you finish your second year is out the window. There are a handful of colleges, like Williams, that are wealthy enough to continue offering exclusively or primarily liberal arts majors. And their students, too, may gain a, a liberal arts education while they're there. But many, if not most, of their entering students are really looking for a credential for graduate or professional school or for a, or for a better job. Most colleges, however, don't have large endowments. And in the absolutely astonishing words of David Swenson, the widely regarded, highly regarded uh, investment uh, manager for Yale, those colleges with smaller endowments are forced, forced to respond to the wishes and needs of the current student body to attract sufficient numbers of students to maintain current operations. I mean, ever, if ever there was any reason to doubt that, that higher education is not a typical business, David Swenson puts the lie to it. Financial aid discounting has soared. 45 or 50 percent discounts are now the norm. In 2007, Harvard uh, exacerbated this by announcing that it was uh, totally abandoning uh, loans and going entirely to grants, and, that, and further that it would uh, make grants to families with annual incomes of up to $180,000. And a few months later, Yale trumped them by going to $200,000. Suppose you have a car dealer who's selling cars that have a list price of $40,000. And the dealer has two potential buyers on his showroom floor. And he says, he, one of them says, all right, I'll give you $40,000. $40, and the other says, well, I can only give you $20,000. And the dealer turns to the second buyer and says, sold. Now, we might say that, uh, we might say that that dealer was an idiot. But colleges routinely routinely sell to the low bidder, the buyer that commands the largest financial aid. Unlike auto dealers, one buyer's money is not as good as the next. Education is the only business of which I am aware where the sale of the good or service produced, and, the, uh, and education in this case, and the purchase of the main input of production, students in this case, are accomplished in one and the same transaction. Are we selling education or buying students? In 1968, Garrett Hardin wrote a famous article in Science Magazine entitled The Tragedy of the Commons. It considered situations in which individuals 
acting independently in pursuit of their own self-interest deplete a shared limited resource to the detriment of everyone's long-term interest. As more sheep are put on the commons, it becomes overgrazed and less able to support the sheep. As fishermen tr catch more and more fish in order to increase their own private wealth, they deplete the supply of fish and everyone loses. Uh, individual nations seeking to protect themselves by increasing their atomic arsenals collectively multiply the likelihood of a nuclear holocaust. Liberal arts colleges are doing absolutely everything in their power to attract students. They have fancier dorms, more elaborate sports facilities, smaller classes, fewer requirements, easier admission standards, more intense recruiting efforts, and above all, more financial aid. And as a result of their furious competition, their operating expenses become greater and greater, and their operating revenues less and less. What colleges are doing is exactly wrong. They are compounding, not solving their financial problems. It's the tragedy of the commons redux. Well, <clears throat> briefly, <clears throat> why should we care if we do? Uh, 200 years ago, Lord Brougham uh, observed, education makes people easy to lead but difficult to drive, easy to govern but impossible to enslave. He was talking about a thoughtful citizenry, not a trained workforce. Vocational education focuses students' mind on the utility of the knowledge being acquired. Liberal arts education focuses students' minds on the utility of acquiring knowledge. Liberal arts education, in Cardinal Newman's much quoted words, instills thoughtfulness as a habit of mind. It also, as, uh, as Jane pointed out, uh, directly benefits the nation uh, by providing leaders. Just, just looking at the tiny little liberal arts colleges that only per, per, uh, graduate a percent or two of the graduates in the country, paying no attention for this purpose to, the, uh, uh, to colleges. Twelve of our 44 presidents in this country attended a liberal arts college. One of them attended two. Uh, Garfield went to both Hiram and Williams. Uh, in the last Congress, in the 111th, 14% um, of the representatives and 9% of the senators went to liberal arts colleges. In, uh, in the 10 years between 99 and 2008, nearly a quarter of all of the Nobel laureates who received their undergraduate education in the U.S. received them at a liberal arts college. And in the 2005 to 2008 four-year period, 12 of the 99 MacArthur F Fellowship recipients, the so-called Genius Awards, attended were graduates of liberal arts colleges of Bates, Bennington, Calvin, Carleton, Hampshire, Haverford, Illinois Wesleyan, Kalamazoo, Oberlin, Smith, Smith, Trinity, and Wesleyan. And, of course, huge numbers of business leaders and, and entrepreneurs, disproportionately large numbers, uh, not to mention scientists, teachers, journalists, writers, artists, public figures of all kinds, went to liberal arts colleges. Bill Belichick, for example, the coach of the, of the Boston Patriots, went to, as did Tommy Heinsohn, incidentally, for those of you from New England. Um, I have a very dear, Linda and I have a very dear friend who, who, was an ex, who is an extremely successful corporate executive who never went to college. And I talked to him once about Beloit, where I was uh, at the time, and I said, you know, at Beloit, we, we instill uh, critical thinking in our students. Do you feel that you're a less critical thinker because you didn't go to college? And he said, no, indeed, I think I'm a very critical thinker. And I said, well, w we also stress uh, oral and written communications. Do you feel inadequate in these areas? And he said, on the contrary, I feel I'm a better communicator than most. And, and I said, well, then I, I assume you don't regret not having gone to college. He said, no, indeed, I regret it very deeply. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, I feel left out of art and literature and culture. It's, um, it's a sad thing because the, 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 the enrichment aspect of liberal education is not something that college recruiters talk about very much, possibly because they surmise that 17-year-olds won't care. But uh, I, think, I think that a full and active life of the mind, in addition to your daily life, is very likely the greatest gift of all of a liberal education. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Oakley, who's written brilliantly on this, will have a, 
word or two to say about that. Uh, there has incidentally long been a view about the liberal arts uh, that it is appropriate only for the select few. Uh, for instance, when Woodrow Wilson was president of Princeton, he told a meeting of New York high school teachers, and I quote, we want one class of persons who have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a much larger class of necessity in every society, to forgo the privilege of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific manual tasks. Uh, I consider this still prevalent view to be elitist, sure to punish the poor and favor the privileged and wrong. So where are we? The demand, the demand decline for, for liberal arts education is the elephant in the parlor of liberal arts. What can be done about it? So long as colleges and universities continue to go it alone, to compete furiously rather than cooperate and work together, the answer is simple, nothing. And unhappily, colleges tend to be obsessed with their uniqueness, and cooperation comes hard for them. There has been, uh, as my lawyer friends know, one good example of effective cooperation between liberal arts colleges. In 1952, the Ivy League colleges got together and formed an agreement to stop giving, uh, uh, stop giving big, uh, uh, to stop bidding wars for star athletes. And a few years later, in 1958, they were joined by MIT, Tufts, and 13 of the wealthy uh, liberal arts colleges in New England to form the Overlap Group. And for 32 years, the overlap, gr overlap Group met every year and agreed to the financial aid discount that each student applying to more than one of the schools was entitled to receive. And there were similar groups, less publicized, but nonetheless similar in different parts of the country. Beloit College belonged to one. The, the purpose of, these, of the Overlap Group was to limit discounts based on merit, so as to increase the funds available for discounts based on need. But in 1990, the antitrust division f filed an antitrust suit against the overlap group. And then Attorney General uh, Thornburg said, all parents are entitled to competitive prices and discounts just as they are for any other good or service. When that suit was filed, the Ivies immediately folded. Uh, the liberal arts colleges just disappeared. And the only one who fought on was MIT. And even in the end, when it looked like MIT might prevail, it threw in its hand too because I think there was no one left to agree with. So that decision remains. And, uh, and it's really irrelevant to my talk, but do you know that the, uh, uh, the reserve clause in ba baseball contracts, which are essentially agreements by the team not to raid each other's rosters, which were held to be not a violation of the antitrust laws in a bizarre opinion by Justice, uh, uh, Justice Holmes uh, a long time ago, <clears throat> the overlaps group was, were essentially agreeing not to raid each other's student rosters, and it's illegal. Um, there's no evidence that, it, that the overlap group agreements ever raised the price of college, which is the usual purpose and effect of a price-fixing agreement. And there's certainly no question that the elimination of the overlap group increased the likelihood that rich kids get bigger discounts at the expense of poor kids. Morty Shapiro, who I'm sure many of us know, former president of, now the president of Northwestern, and former president of Williams, isn't that right, Williams? Mm -hmm. Said, you can't say someone should be need blind unless they have the resources to fund it. It sounds immoral to replace really talented low income kids with less talented richer kids, but unless you're a Williams or Amherst, the alternative is the quality of education declines for everyone. Uh, ultimately, without a massive, cooperative, joint effort by the colleges and universities to educate America about the enormous value to individuals and to the nation as a whole of a liberal education, the decline of liberal arts education will continue almost certainly at an accelerating rate. And it isn't enough, incidentally, to do what most colleges do, and that is to simply try to persuade 17-year-old kids and their nervous parents of the value of a liberal education, because after all, those kids are hearing from their high school counselors, their friends and neighbors, local and state and national leaders, even the federal government, that career preparation is the thing. So here's my good news and my bad news. The good news is 
in this country there is a stunning array of talented, well-known, well-regarded leaders in every field who are the products of liberal arts education. Perhaps not all of them, but surely most of them believe they've been advantaged, both in terms of their careers and of the quality of their lives, by being liberally educated. Mobilized to speak out, their lives and experiences make a stunning case for liberal education. The bad news is that such mobilization is a huge project, certainly can't be accomplished overnight, and there is, I think, Scott, no organization or entity on the scene that appears to have the ability or at least the inclination to take this project on. Uh, a few weeks ago, I received a uh, depressing note from my friend Roger Rosenblatt, and he had just read my book, and he sent me a card and said, uh, I'm afraid your next book is going to have to be entitled uh, Over the Brink. And I certainly, I certainly hope Roger's wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've given us a lot to think about, and I'm sure that our commentators will pull out some of the important issues. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Scott Jasek with Inside Higher Ed. We were privileged to publish uh, Vic, an op-ed by Vic, which summarized some of the themes of his book recently, and he focused on the question of why aren't liberal arts college leaders talking about these challenges? And in fact, I, I would argue that in public, there's not, they're not really talking. And uh, in terms of the Wilson Center's role here in Washington, they're totally not talking about that. I think if you look at the federal interest, for instance, in higher ed, it is so far removed from uh, traditional, from the residential liberal arts uh, education, you wouldn't even know it was taking place. At the beginning of the Spellings Commission report, there was sort of a hint she was going to go there, but aside from bashing them briefly, there really hasn't been much attention to this. Now, my perspective, I have not done the sort of empirical study that makes up Vic's <coughs> book, nor have I led a distinguished liberal arts college like the next commentator, but as a journalist, um, I get all the liberal arts college presidents coming to tell me how wonderful their institutions are and to pitch their institutions and I sort of see through that I think how they're trying to pitch themselves as well to students and so it's through that framework and writing about what's going on at these colleges that I think about this question of are they at the brink. Whenever I pose the question to leaders of liberal arts colleges, they always come back and say that people have been predicting the demise of liberal arts colleges for centuries, and it hasn't happened. So be skeptical is generally what they say. But if you uh, look at the news of late, we've been writing about some that have downright disappeared. Just last week, Lambeth University uh, in Tennessee, uh, after a two-year struggle, died. Um, Dana College in Nebraska, after trying to engineer a purchase to a for-profit group of investors, uh, when that was blocked, it died. The year before, Waldorf stayed alive, another liberal arts college, by being sold to a for-profit entity. Now, what do these sort of true demises show? I would say, one, they show it is possible for liberal arts colleges to die. Two, it's gradual. If you look at the colleges that actually disappear, it's not a single crisis. These colleges were on the brink for decades, and actually it's somewhat miraculous that they stayed alive as long as they did. What you see in common is you see one or two key donors that were balancing the budget at basically endowmentless institutions. You see a pattern of a tie to religious institutions that no longer were providing much in financial support, or, or, or students, um, you see very small colleges and the, econ and the failure to have the economies of scale that even a college of, say, a thousand enrollment has. Um, and you see that last minute efforts to re-engineer themselves failed. Um, in some cases by trying to become a for-profit, in some cases by trying to very quickly go into distance ed. You, you can't say, it's very hard to truly turn around a dying institution. So that's at one extreme. Now, the, ex the other extreme of, say, Williams and Smith, I'm not worried that they're going to be at the brink. They're actually going to be okay. They're going to have their challenges, but it's the great middle 
that I think is dealing with the issues that, that I think uh, Vic's book speaks to the most. And here, let me give a few examples that I think show the, the pressures. Uh, Beloit, uh, the institution that Vic led, uh, this is after he was no longer the president, <laughs> um, w in 2008, they were down 36 students from their projected enrollment. They had to lay off 40 people to balance the budget. Um, so th think about that. You're, you're, you don't have margins for error. Sweet Briar in 2009, they, they enrolled 605 instead of 650. As a result, they had to suspend payments to the retirement plan. Um, Wisconsin Lutheran College causes of eliminated their political science department as an effort to cut the budget. Think about that. Think about a reality where a liberal arts college can sort of look, itself, look at itself in the mirror and say that political science is a luxury it cannot afford. Um, I did a feature uh, last year about a professor at Centenary College who was losing his job. He was at Centenary in Louisiana, a, a liberal arts college. He was the last classicist at the college. And so I did a feature on what's it like to be the last classicist at a liberal arts college, shutting down a Latin and Greek program. These are the sorts of realities that we are seeing at the institutions that are struggling financially. And what they show is that very few institutions feel they have the luxury to support things that they don't see as, quote, a revenue stream, that they don't see attracting more students. So how are they responding? One is through so-called merit aid. And I use the quotes because it's not really merit. I mean, this is something you talked about. What merit aid really is, is if I am admitted to Williams and I'm admitted to second tier liberal arts college and my parents can afford to spend and are willing to spend $25,000 a year on my education, it's convincing me not to go to Williams but to go to that other college. Merit aid is about identifying kids from the right zip codes. So the, the, the second tier liberal arts colleges are going all out on merit aid. That means that their discount rates are going way up. This is something as well that's alluded to in the book. I love to ask the presidents who visit me, what's your discount rate? And if they say they don't know, I don't really believe them because I think they know their discount rate. Um, they just, they have to. And it's great if you ask them two years ago, what would be an acceptable level for your discount rate? Well, right now they're above that because what they have all decided based on the sorts of anecdotes I was sharing earlier is that students are the lifeblood of our institution, so we'll do whatever it takes to fill the class. Filling the class is the norm. Sweetbriar, which I mentioned, refused to let its discount rate go up, and so the uh, conventional wisdom is that was a mistake. And so what you see is the discount rate rises. That's not sustainable for the long run. And, and what you see is colleges rating their rainy day funds are emptying out. And most colleges could, can do this for a few years. The question is how long can they do this? The other thing you see is adding on new programs, adding on business programs. Some liberal arts colleges have no shame about adding a business degree. Others will add a business degree but call it something else. It's very interesting to see what they will name it to avoid admitting that they have business majors. Or you see nursing programs, pharmacy programs. What a lot of places that identify themselves as liberal arts colleges are not in the traditional method. Now, don't get me wrong. I, we all value nurses and pharmacists and good business people. But the question is, is this the liberal arts institution? Um, Brandeis University is a very good example. Uh, although it is a university, its undergraduate program traditionally would have called itself a liberal arts institution. They added a business major. Um, tried to sell off one of the best collections of modern art in the country. Um, why did they do this? Because they didn't see the modern art contributing to their bottom line. They thought a business major would. Um, I wrote about Augustana College, which is a very, inter very good liberal arts college. They also added business majors, but what's interesting is that these additions also challenge other traditions at the colleges. Augustana is a holdout in that Augustana does not pay faculty by different disciplines. It's uh, different levels for different disciplines. It's one of the few places where the poetry professor 
earns the same as the economics professor. Um, guess what? If you add a business degree, that doesn't last. Um, because you don't have that shared view of what the liberal arts is. So these changes go beyond just adding a business degree. The other thing they're always searching for, and this is what they're always begging us to do stories on, is dis what you talk about this distinctiveness. They want to stand out in some way. And so we just did a story about Whitman College, a very good liberal arts college in Washington State. And so they decided they were going to stand out by announcing that they were unpretentious. Um, but they didn't like our story because our story was about how most of the students said saying you're unpretentious is kind of pretentious. And, 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 um, but, but what it shows is this desperation to say we're not just another liberal arts college. This is how we're different. And so you see the boasting about we have the best JAN term or we have the best internship program or we have the best experiential learning or whatever. It's all trying to be distinctive in some way rather than talk about the value of the liberal arts, which they don't do, um, and where I think you're absolutely right. Um, long term, real danger, financial dangers from the discount rate, real dangers from the value equation, the impact of the discount rate. Um, you might buy a used car, but do you think it's the best quality used car, uh, best quality car if you have a sense that something is on the market to be bargained over? Other big issue, gender. Um, Smith College could soon be the norm in liberal arts education because men are abandoning liberal arts education. An increasing number of liberal arts colleges, especially if you go below the prestige of a Williams, um, the norm is 60-40, 66-33, and, and this is a very um, dangerous dynamic. Now, there's a lot of unwillingness to talk about it because people say, hey, when top colleges were two-thirds male, nobody called it a problem. But um, when you have a sector of higher education that is not attracting a major sector of the population, I would argue that it's a big problem. Many liberal arts colleges also have more difficulty attracting minority students. The perception that it is elite and white, I think, is a very serious one. And when things get that perception, people don't do it. If you look at, say, for instance, study abroad is perceived as something that white women do. And once something is identified in that way, it's great for the white women who study abroad, but not for society. Signs of change. Well, there are some interesting things going on that could help. Swanee, which is a liberal art, the University of the South, a good liberal arts institution, cut its tuition by 10% this year because they noticed their discount rate and their merit aid was going way up. And so they said, we're going to cut all that out and just give you an honest tuition rate. Be very interesting to see if that happens. Um, other things, and they did, they're not adjusting their curriculum. Um, two big things that I think will affect the, the health of liberal arts colleges are taking place outside of liberal arts colleges. One is the horrific cuts to state colleges and universities' budgets. And this plays out in several ways. One, this could be a good thing for liberal arts colleges. Many liberal arts colleges are already sort of campaigning for students saying, well, it'll cost you six years at a Cal State, but only four years at Pomona, because you'll get through and graduate and get out. Um, and that's true, because it's become harder and harder to get through a state university in four years, because all your sections keep getting canceled. Likewise, large classes um, at many state universities, as budgets have been cut, class size has just gotten up hugely. Um, academic advising is being hurt. All of these things provide a very nice contrast for liberal arts colleges. But you'll notice what I'm talking about here is the size and concern of the institution, not the liberal arts ethos. They're not promoting the liberal arts ethos. They're saying you'll actually have a professor who will talk to you. Now, that's a good value, but that, that professor could be talking to you about accounting. So I'm not sure that it's really a solution. I also think there's a broader problem posed to liberal arts education by what's going on in the state universities, in that more and more state universities are viewing liberal arts disciplines as a luxury. And at places like state, especially at the regional state universities, um, you're seeing foreign languages gutted, humanities gutted, philosophy gutted. What does it do to liberal arts education when most students 
never encounter the liberal arts even at a large public university. When the idea of taking French or philosophy becomes just a weird thing, I would argue that liberal arts education is hurt by that. And so I think it is being hurt by what's going on in the state universities. The other big thing, and this is actually a big Washington issue that is affecting liberal arts education, is the debate over for-profit higher education. In the last year, we've seen this ferocious debate over the proposed regulations on gainful employment, which those of you who are uh, higher ed uh, policy wonks or former members of Congress know what I'm talking about. Um, and what's very interesting is these regs are supposed to apply mainly to for-profit higher ed and a few vocational programs in community colleges. The campaign, and as, as a journalist, I'm on the receiving end of the for-profit campaign, and I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody call me up from the for-profit lobbying group and say, how come you aren't writing more stories about philosophy grads from Williams? And they view that as their secret weapon to attack gainful employment regs, because the official stance of the for-profit lobby is apply it to everyone equally. Now, you can argue that Williams is not promising its philosophy majors, or maybe I should say art history would be a better major to pick for, for a well-known Williams major. They're not pr promising their art history majors riches. But what the for-profit lobbying campaign, I think, has very effectively done is defined the success of higher ed as job preparation and drawn attention to that in this very difficult economy the chances are good that the person who gave you your Starbucks might have had a liberal arts degree somewhere along the way. And this makes parents very uncomfortable. It terrifies college presidents. It, you know, it, 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 it's, it's great if you're hiring. But it's a very di difficult dynamic. So I would say that these things outside of the liberal arts sphere are also having a big effect on the liberal arts sphere. Um, I wish I could offer some magic solution. I can't. But I did bring a, a souvenir for you all for thinking and talking about higher ed. We do, our, our best giveaway is a poetry magnet with higher education words. And, and we ask our readers who are in higher education to nominate words. And you can see that li from our evidence, liberal arts education is alive. We have words like classical and languages and post-colonial. But you can also see what else was on our readers' minds this year, because for the first time, our magnet features the word furlough. So <laughs> these are challenging times for academics. Um, I've enjoyed uh, publishing, Vic, and thinking about the issues raised, and so I really appreciate the invitation here. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Frank Oakley. It's a great pleasure to be back at the Wilson Center, though it didn't look this plushy <laughs> my day as a, a fellow here. You know, by way of a, uh, intellectual throat clearing or whatever you would want to call it, um, let me emphasize that our topic is not the general situation of the liberal arts at large. If it were, we'd have to try to come to terms with how many students nationwide were taking courses in the liberal arts because of general education requirements at every level of our higher education enterprise, over, what, 4,000 institutions from the great research universities to the community colleges. That, that would be a very difficult assignment because we do not have global comprehensive statistics about course enrollments. What we have is gloomy statistics on majoring and baccalaureate degrees awarded. So we have an incomplete picture. One could be optimistic or pessimistic about what we don't know. I like to be optimistic, but I don't ask me why or what that's based on. Happily, that's not our issue today. Vic's book is focused specifically, obviously, on the fate solely of our liberal arts colleges and on how well or how badly they're doing in providing those students with an education in the liberal arts, which I take it to mean arts and sciences. And let me, if I may, congratulate him. 
on that book, which is a lively, informative, and stimulating read. I myself show both his enthusiasm for the great contribution made on behalf, uh, his enthusiasm for liberal arts education at large and for the contribution made by uh, liberal arts independent freestanding residential liberal arts colleges, which belong, of course, to the oldest, deepest, noblest, and most distinctive stratum in the complex geology of American higher education. And beyond that, I share his worry that that contribution is being in some measure undercut, undermined by admissions processes and the concomitant drift towards more vocational forms of instruction. But you know, that much acknowledged, and I mean it, I don't think there's a great deal to be said for my using my modest allotment of time to engage with him in any sort of exercise in competitive agreement. Uh, so with his permission, I'd like to adopt a mildly contrarian approach, if I may. Contrarian about what, you might well ask. Well, about a rather fundamental issue. Vic, I think, draws too sharp a line between the liberal arts college and the research university. After all, the precise distinction we are accustomed to make between colleges and universities is an American novelty and a comparatively recent one at that, dates to the late 19th century, when over here, the German research university was becoming the dominant ideal for higher education. And when research university presidents, people quite full of themselves at the time, like David Starr Jordan of Stanford, began to use the term college in pejorative fashion, and in such a way as to suggest that unlike his beloved Stanford, the old colleges were not universities at all, but really nothing more than academies, i.e. advanced secondary schools. That, of course, is historical nonsense. Whatever their origins, even if like Williams they began as schools, they were in fact not schools, but one college universities possessed after all of the crucial prerogative that had long distinguished universities from other educational entities, namely the prerogative of granting degrees. Their institutional model was not the academy or secondary school, but the single college university that had emerged in the 15th and 16th centuries. For example, Marischal College in A uh, Aberdeen or Trinity College, Dublin. That fact was recognized by law, with Trinity College bearing the legal intitulation, the rather complicated one, of the University of Trinity College, Dublin, just as Yale College was later described in a lawsuit as the University of Yale College in New Haven. Well, why fuss in this quintessentially academic fashion about matters of intitulation? nomenclature. Well, I do so because I strongly believe that this sharp American style distinction between college and university has not been at all helpful. The condescending <coughs> graduate school professors whom Vic refers to in his book, usually natural law, uh, science professors in my experience, <laughs> who discourage the best students from taking positions at liberal arts colleges have made the mistake of buying into that sharp distinction. That distinction has functioned to promote the idea that the freestanding liberal arts college is something less than the American style research university rather than something other than that. And it's enco encouraged the colleges themselves to permit others to define them in terms of what they lack great research libraries, uh, laboratories, graduate and professional schools, for example, rather than in terms of what they proudly possess, a firm, unwavering, undistracted commitment to bringing to the education of undergraduates the full resources proper to a small university. 
That, in fact, is what they are, small college universities devoting themselves exclusively to the teaching of undergraduates. And by following a now partially imperiled tradition to the instruction of those undergraduates in the liberal arts, or arts and sciences. Now, rightly or wrongly, Vic, and you'll undoubtedly tell me if I'm, I'm wrong, I sense from what you have to say in the book that you yourself have succumbed a bit to the temptation of defining liberal arts colleges in terms of what they lack and to thinking of them somehow as something less than the research university. You properly stress the centrality of excellent teaching to their mission, but you seem, to me anyway, instinctively to view teaching in performative terms. Your preoccupation seems to be with the how, the way it's done, not with the what, the content of what is taught and some bizarre things are taught around the country in our institutions of higher education. I hate to think about it. You're accordingly, I think, skeptical about the pertinence of PhD acquisition to good teaching, as also about the pertinence of productive research scholarship to the collegiate tradition. And you don't think that scholarly publications should be assessed or at least separately assessed as part of retention and promotion decisions. Beyond that, you clearly believe that so far as teaching and scholarly productivity go, what's involved is a zero-sum game. The more time and effort professors devote to teaching, you say, the less time they have available for research and writing for publication. Well, there's nothing, of course, odd or singular about such beliefs. They enjoy a currency widespread enough to make them seem like obvious common sense. But in the spirit of this occasion, I'd like to contest them and contest them on the grounds that they run counter to the available facts on the matter. What facts, you may well say? Well, the facts made available by a whole series of pertinent data collections and from a series of empirical social scientific studies over the past 30, 40 years done by scholars like Trow and Fulton, Seymour Martin Lipset and Everett Carl Ladd, Robert McCaughey of Barnard and Alexander Astin and his colleagues at the UCLA Higher Education Research Institute. They have placed at our disposal a regrettably underutilized store of empirical data which speak to faculty attitudes towards teaching and research over the past 40 years or so and about pertinent faculty behavior in that connection and a particularly rich, much lamented, deceased source of such data were the Carnegie faculty surveys conducted at five-year intervals from 1969, I believe, to 1994, a truly serious loss when that was discontinued. So, if you are to ask me, and I do hope you will, what such surveys and studies reveal, I would reply by focusing on four principal sets of findings. First, faculty attitudes nationwide at all levels of our higher education system. These certainly do not break down along any university college axis. In the 1980s, it turned out that only 7% of, of the American professoriate were willing to affirm that their interest lay heavily in research, whereas over 70% reported that their primary interest lay in teaching. Even at the largest state universities, 50% of the total faculty claim to be more interested in teaching than research. Conclusion, if, it's an important if, if you were to judge by the faculty's own self-conception, which may be a dangerous thing to do, the American academic system as a whole is primarily a teaching system. Second, well, Okay, that's true of faculty attitudes, it seems. But does actual faculty behavior align with those professed attitudes? 
The answer is yes, indeed it does. A wholly disproportionate amount of scholarly publication overall is produced by no more than 10% of the professoriate. Clearly a bunch of compulsive recidivists churning it out uh, in, in vast amounts. Less than a fourth of the professoriate um, publish at all extensively. A clear majority of our faculty nationwide publish little or nothing and appear to be research inactive. Publish or perish is the old cliche, but great numbers of non-perishers are also non-publishers. So far as our leading universities go, I suspect the publish and perish would be a more accurate, accurately descriptive of the real state of affairs. Third, what about the zero-sum game conclusion? Well, obviously, life short, um, everyone's time is limited, and a fairly recent UCLA study of a, a carefully balanced sample of 200 universities and colleges did generate some data that would fit in with the zero-sum game idea. Thus, they found that the top 10 <coughs> institutions that fell both in the top percent in research orientation, that was the expression they used, and the bo bottom 10% in student or teaching orientation, all were research universities, eight of them huge state universities. They also found that of the top of the 10 institutions that fell into the bottom 10% in research orientation, but also into the top 10% in student or teaching orientation, all were non-selective liberal arts colleges in the old Carnegie Liberal Arts II category. The sort of colleges where the inroads of vocational or pre-professional studies have been so very, very marked. About such figures, there's nothing counterintuitive, but other findings may well be. They underline the complexity of the issue and the fact that thinking in terms of a zero-sum game between teaching and research, however obvious it may be, simply doesn't align with all of the facts. Some people seem to do more of everything, and the crucial variable uh, may well not be the amount of available time or differences in priorities, but simply differential levels of energy. Thus, at the research universities, it turns out, at least in aggregate, important qualification, that those faculty most active in research are not that very different either in teaching activity or interest in undergraduates from their less research active colleagues. And they are, it turns out, much more likely than those less active colleagues to be involved in the administrative <coughs> and governance processes of department and university. Again, faculty at the state colleges and comprehensive institutions who come in at the low end on research orientation also, alas, because they account for a full third of the baccalaureates produced in this country, they also come in at the low end on student and teaching orientation. The time freed up from research demands does not seem to have translated into any enhanced preoccupation with effective teaching. And while these data do attest to a divide running between the so-called research and teaching institutions, that divide turns out to lie not between the universities with a substantial commitment to graduate and professional education and the four and two-year colleges, but to run instead between the universities and the highly selective colleges on the one hand, with the latter showing significant levels of research activity, and on the other, the less selective colleges. That's to say the pertinent divide runs right through the collegiate sector. Finally, I'm about to wind up. Of the eight institutions which Aston and colleagues found to rank at the high end on both teaching and research orientation, all were highly selective liberal arts colleges whose names, Williams among them, would be familiar to everybody in this room. No zero-sum game between teaching and research, even on the horizon. 
And these are colleges, I, I would insist, these are colleges where student expectations for teaching effectiveness are enormously high, very hard on young people starting out, and where the institutional commitment to the central importance of good teaching in the liberal arts remains clear, consistent, unwavering, unambiguous, and proudly so. Let me leave it at that. Do you want to respond before we open it up? I'd, I'd just like to say how pleased I am to have uh, uh, Frank Oakley and Scott Jassick here today. I think the diversity of their perspectives uh, helps me, and I hope it helped all of you. I'm very fortunate. Okay, we have some hands. Uh, please wait for a mic and identify yourself. Steve, you want to start? Um, my name is Stephen Shore. It was a, I thought it was a wonderful presentation. Um, I have two brief questions. The first is it's true that many successful men and women have a liberal arts education, but <coughs> couldn't this be this post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy that many, regardless of what they had, would have been, regardless of what education they had, would have been successful anyway? And the other question is it's, it's, People, there is a kind of dirge for the failure of some liberal arts programs, but couldn't the result uh, the, the, the may in, indeed be too many young Americans in college who should not be there? And perhaps if the percentage declined, it would be nice to go to a college who, where you're a student and mo uh, all, most of your fellow students actually want to be there. So couldn't the net result be a fewer number of liberal arts colleges, but with those attracting people who go f w the, for the program and the process. I'm a, a Johnny myself, and St. John's is probably the, the or liberal arts college in America, and uh, financially str much stronger than it was a generation ago, two campuses, but with no real, no compromise to get students. It means the whole four years are required, and yet this has not been a detriment. Uh, well, the answer to your first question is, y is yes, of course it could be that. Um, but you know, it, it, that fallacy doesn't exist in a vacuum. I, I am likely to succeed because of my background. And if I come from a different background, I will be less likely to succeed even though I'm still me. And, uh, and the, the, the notion I have at least is that there are a lot of people who could be in the group with me who don't have that opportunity. Um, with respect to the... Um, uh, to the uh, problem that Johnny's face, uh, they, they, they have trouble remembering the last time the, the curriculum changed. You know, there's a, <laughs> this vague notion that Aeschylus, when Aeschylus was substituted for, but, um, <clears throat> uh, well, the, 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 say, say it again, I've now, I, I was violating, a, I was doing what uh, Hubert Humphrey said. Doing what Hubert, too many students. Yeah, yeah, but I was doing what Hubert Humphrey said you, you, shouldn't, you should do, and that was listen while you talk, you might say something good, and I was losing interest. <laughs> so I, uh, no, I don't think there are too many kids. I don't think, I, I'm just flat out, I, I don't see any point in arguing, but I just think it's, uh, I know how we decide, I know what merit means. It means giving aid to, to well-to-do kids. That's what it means, and, except for, you know, the occasional black cellist and star athlete, you know. Uh, that's what it means, and I don't think that's a good idea. And I think, I think there are huge numbers of young people who, given half a chance, could be just as successful as the graduates of Williams or Smith, and uh, I think the nation needs them. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Sarah Fritz. Um, I spent about a quarter of a century on the board of my liberal arts college, so I have a little re recollection of how, how this works. Back in the early 90s, uh, this, this idea of vocational education also came up, and that was when they decided to start discounting. Um, actually, Yale and Harvard came late to this. The college I, I uh, went to started in the early 90s, and discounting is, I think you've said it, but not uh, quite the way I view it. Discounting is more than an economic bargain. It creates an elitist um, situation. You know that 
that uh, very few of the kids who go to liberal arts colleges now have Pell Grants. It, 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 the discounting has excluded all the poor kids. And you have this sort of elitist uh, thing that really draws them to those college, continues to draw them, particularly those who are influenced by their parents who went to the similar kind of college. So uh, I think it's easy for liberal arts colleges to uh, come up with a new remedy. And I suspect the new remedy will be something like um, you get an extra leg up in graduate school, which would be what I'd do. I'd start having advanced placement courses in your senior year in, at liberal arts school so that you, uh, and you know, there were recruiters from the graduate schools who came to your college. I think the thing that's really challenging liberal arts colleges now, however, is one, that they cost too much, and secondly, that you're not getting as much as you thought you were. Two books, Academically Adrift, which says basically kids don't learn much in college, and that may be may or may 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 not be true. I, my daughter proved it, but I, other people may have different <laughs> experience. Um, also, the book um, "Debt for You," uh, where they talk about um, the guy suggests that the best way to go to college is to take your early courses at the local community college, get all your 101s and 102s and then move on to a full year, full uh, college, and you cut down the cost. And I think parent, a lot of parents are looking for that. Those two issues, whether you learn something and how much you have to pay, is in my view undercutting the liberal arts at this point. And I think they've got to figure out how to trim costs, and they've got to begin to, to teach uh, a little more rigorously you can get through a liberal arts college nowadays uh, without trying very hard. And um, I guess that's all I have to say. Oh, except I'm going to give a little uh, plug for my own project. I'm the publisher of Youth Today. And we just published a um, compendium, a guide of for-profit colleges, uh, telling people which ones are good and which ones aren't. because. It's the disadvantaged kids who really go to these colleges. And I suggest you look at our website and um, see if you're interested. Look up our guide. Could, could I, I just wanted to draw on something that Sarah was talking about in terms of the way the discounting has evolved, which is once upon a time, liberal arts colleges were educating students who had been sold on the idea of a liberal arts college. So if a uh, Denison is discounting against Kenyon. They've already sort of made the conceptual choice. Today, Denison is more likely to be discounting against the Ohio State Honors College. And to make a dent for an Ohio resident on the Ohio State Honors College tuition, you a uh, thousand bucks isn't going to do it. And what's interesting, and so when Swanee announced its change, what they, it's tuition cut. They noticed their top competitors were not liberal arts colleges, but were the honors colleges at the University of Georgia in North Carolina and so forth. And so what you go, go from is when, when people first started talking about merit aid and discounting, it was like, oh, it's a thousand bucks to a good student. Well, now it's 15,000 bucks to a so-so student who's rich. And, and so that has changed both the, um, ethical equation in terms of what you talked about with Pell Grants, but also the financial equation. This isn't small amounts of money. Um, and, and, and yet, because they're going up against that, uh, that Ohio State or whoever the flagship is in, your, in the Liberal Arts College States, they're at a huge price disadvantage, uh, at least if you're not Williams. Um, Vic and Frank, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah you know, I, too uh, much money, don't learn anything. What do you think? What do you make well, of those so challenges? Well, don't learn anything. I wanted to, yeah. to comment. <laughs> uh, Fifty years wasted, you know. <laughs> uh, that's a cruel comment. But but our you know teams, I think of the people doing higher education research at UCLA, Indiana, and Iowa, I believe. This has been a big issue, you know, when people boast about, I hate the word about outcomes. 
uh, you're likely to get the reply, well, the best predictor of how you do on MCADs or something is how you did on SATs, as if nothing's happened. L at least you haven't done damage in the course of the four <laughs> years or something. And I think the, the fellow, I, I don't know what Scott th thinks about him, or, or, or Vic for that matter, um, George Koo, done intensive, in, I don't do higher educational research, I, I'm just a consumer of it, intensive empirical studies and argues you should be focusing not on this outcome thing because of the sort of worry you, you suggested, and I, I think it was implicit in the question that was asked earlier um, about people coming to college, but what, what exactly goes on at the colleges? And it, it's something that I think metrics will come less easily to, um, I mean, there are plenty of fake metrics around, thrown around all over the place, but, but Ku's conclusions I found encouraging, actually, from this huge database that I forgot the Nessie. name of it. Nessie. Nessie. Um, and it focused heavily, I, I, as I recall, on hu the humanities or the impact of humanistic education on students. You know, and I worry about my students, which do night and day, obviously. Um, I worry about questions of meaning. I, I think the, the worst challenges most of us face in our lives are to do with, with, with questions of, of meaning. Uh, and I, I'd like to believe and I don't think it's a forlorn belief that, that at our colleges we do address those issues. Maybe we could address them more effectively, but we do. And, and the sort of playback you get from alumni, former students, suggests that something happens, that the kids aren't just drinking for four years. They, they may have done a lot of drinking, but not, there'd be other things going on too. There's been a percolation of something other than liquor. You want to jump? No, in? that's good. Okay. Yeah, this gentleman right here. A comment, uh, not a question. Uh, my name is Tom Dickinson. I am a product of a liberal arts education, Beloit College, class of 1973. I had graduated uh, long before Vic became president, but I was on the Alumni Association, uh, president of the board of directors for the entire time that Vic was president. And as a result, I had a chance to interact with him uh, fruitfully and beneficially in, in many ways. But I just wanted to commend Vic for his consistent dedication to liberal arts. I, I remember many meetings uh, on the, with the Alumni Association Board of Directors when Vic would come in and talk about the state of the college and give us kind of a rundown of things. And he would say, he'd talk about things like the discount rate and, and uh, financial aid programs and things that the college was doing. But he would say things like, if I wanted Beloit College to be the best nursing school in the country, or if I wanted Beloit College to have the best information technology program in the country, I could do that. We could make that happen. But he said, that's not what Beloit College has been about, and that's not what it will be about. It will continue and always will be one of the best liberal arts colleges in the United States. Because liberal arts colleges produce people who are not afraid to engage in the world of ideas, who are not afraid to get in and contribute, use good judgment, use good thought, use analysis, and so on, that they've gained through their liberal arts education. So Vic has been very consistent in this all along, and I commend him for that. Uh, I think all around us we see the, the products, as, as he pointed out in his remarks here today, the, the kinds of leaders that this country has produced that have come out of a liberal arts education. But uh, I had a great, great working relationship with Vic during his time as, as president. Uh, when he was there, Beloit College really became a, a great institution. He was a great president. Uh, there's no question about it in the, the 10 or 12 presidents that Beloit College has had. You know, Vic truly is up there with the top one or two or three. Uh, and he knows who I'm talking about. Um, so I can't thank him enough, and I just want to commend him for that consistent dedication and, and vocal advocacy for, for liberal arts education that, that continues to make liberal arts uh, what it is today. So thank you, Vic. Tom, I'm very glad you're here. <laughs> could, 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 this brings, to, uh, brings into focus something for me. The first questioner led to this. Williams and Amherst are okay, and Swarthmore, and Smith, and on and on. The bottom half of the list of 225 colleges 
aren't going to fail for the most part. They're going to survive, but it's something very different from what they are now. The, the real challenge, as you, you suggest, is the colleges 50 to 125, or in that range, who still are committed to playing the liberal arts game, but don't have the resources that, uh, that Swarthmore and, uh, and Smith have. Um, and what will become of them, I don't know. But, you know, it's, uh, the world is going to change, and they're going to be, uh, kids read less, and they're going to do different things, and, and they're going to be fewer liberal arts colleges. But if, if we could save some of them, if we could save some of them, it would be a good thing. And I'd like to mention just one other thing, which I couldn't fit into my remarks, but I feel very strongly about, and that's one aspect of curriculum. Uh, uh, we talk a lot about curriculum in higher education, and I happen to think it's, a, it's not worth talking about. I think good teaching is what you should be talking about, not, not curriculum. I, my idea of a perfect curriculum is uh, a kid taking 32 courses from the 32 best teachers in the, in the college or university. But there's one exception to that in my mind, and that's history. 15% uh, of American college students take a history course. 85% take no history. I mean, it's just, you know, I believe very strongly that if you're a leader and you're thinking about sending a Western army into a Middle Eastern country, that it should at least occur to you the possibility <laughs> that they would not be greeted as liberators. And, and, and it is scary, and that's why I'm so, um, so concerned about this endless focus on a, on a trained workforce as opposed to a thought, thoughtful citizenry because uh, one doesn't replace the other. Excuse me for saying that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go, can you wait for the mic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can you wait for the mic? Please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Fred Winter. Um, two observations, but one question. Let me get to the question last. Um, one, I, I think that it would. Our conversation needs to expand perhaps to include more of what was just alluded to, which is the role of community colleges and the very different curricular structure there um, in the issue. Um, structurally, there are, an, of, of your list of liberal arts colleges, um, if you look very carefully at the enrollment patterns, you will find, especially in that bottom half, that there are a number that have junior classes that are larger than their freshman and sophomore classes because of the transfer in issue. So it's not so much a question of what they're being taught at the school that they graduate from, but what they're being taught at the one, two, or perhaps even three or four schools that they went to before they actually got there. Um, the other issue that needs to be part of the hopper in the conversation is the role of adjuncts as opposed to traditional tenure track faculty and how that is transforming the academy. But, but my question is, um, we started out with four very critical points. Um, what's going on? Why is it happening? Does it matter? And can we do anything about it? Um, and I'd, I'd like to get us back to the does it matter um, and frame the answer that I hope I get from, from you um, in a different way from the way it's been, been often given, which is if you look at the great leadership in this country, they are products of these liberal arts institutions. Uh, that, that is certainly true, but I think there's also a part of that that is a result of the fact that the great leaders and people who are on a trajectory to leadership in this country were drawn into that cadre of education because that's where people who were going to become leaders went. In a very different educational constellation today, the argument from history is going to carry less weight. The argument from projection and future is going to be much more important. And I'm still not hearing a convincing argument that could be taken, let's say, to a congressional committee that says, this is why federal engagement in liberal arts education is so important, because this is what it can do for us. And so that third point that you raised is a question that we addressed as, does it matter, is one that I'd like to see us come back to. Yes, please. <laughs> can, can, you wait, can you wait for a mic? <laughs> I, I speak very loudly. Okay, we'll start, start out and then we'll, and then we'll yeah. um, My name is Minerva Serwan and I'm a philosophy professor at Trinity University here in the district. Um, I'm one of those philosophy uh, majors in undergrad and you couldn't prove the unemployability of philosophers by me. I've been employed, I'm 60 years old, and I've been employed all of my adult life doing a variety of things. Um, does it matter? 
Does it matter that we have students who are taking courses uh, in a classroom of 300, among which uh, no one knows whether my particular son is there or not, and who can arrive in that classroom uh, to take the exams uh, on the dates given, and that's it. And the only reason he passes is because I taught him logic, and that's the course that he's taking. Does it matter that uh, when, when a student takes uh, an ethics course and suddenly discovers that she can learn to reflect on a set of circumstances and examine the values that she finds there or not, that she cries because this has never been an experience that she's had before. I don't know if you guys know Trinity is, is you know Trinity, so uh, um, it was that place and it is now this place that you're talking about. Um, say, more, explain. say more about that. Um, it was, uh, it was originally, it was, it was created by nuns for um, uh, the women who were not allowed to go to Catholic University or Georgetown University. And uh, it is now a university that serves primarily um, uh, minority and underprepared urban students very successfully. The difference between a freshman and a senior is so vivid at Trinity that to say that the education that they have received doesn't matter or that the, the, the tradition of examining a text and thinking about it for oneself, of, of joining poetry with astronomy, of doing science because science the natural sciences is a liberal arts, and of getting our faculty to speak to that in a way that engages students who may never take another science course is so crucial to, to our, to what democracy, and I may be simply just so naive because I am a philosopher, and that's what we are, right? But to say that it doesn't matter to a democracy whether what it has amongst its voters is a thoughtful, uh, reflective person or someone who's been trained to do a job that is going to change in, in five years and who will have to be retrained to do that job. Sorry, I, it, 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 I, I can't imagine, uh, I can't imagine what would happen to, to our country and to our view of what democracy is if uh, we continue to have presidents who don't imagine what will happen if they send an army to a Middle East country. Um, we just not be thanks. so political about I, This is, a, wait, wait. I, I mean, this is a, a subject of tremendous interest should not have any political, you know, overtones to it. So, why did I say that was political? She, I, she I, meets I, me. I, was, oh, she meets I think, I think the man who I used to be giving a bed to, <laughs> but who will now sleep on the street, <laughs> brought the, uh, but liberally educated. <laughs> uh, I, it's I have I have a no, you know I mean, come on, let, you you. We, you can you can ask that que a question. You know, if, if you're if people have very str strong intellectual qu qualities, they're going to do better than people who have less strong intellectual qualities. Without regard to whether they're wealthy or whether they're poor, whether whether they have a liberal education or not, who knows? Do, but, uh, who who knows whether knowing something about uh, philosophy and the natural sciences and the social sciences is a good thing? Maybe high school, which is actually a liberal arts. It, curriculum is good enough. Who, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, I come to this with an odd bias because, perhaps because I'm a lawyer, I, about vocational education. I know to a certainty that I didn't learn how to be a lawyer in law school. I know to a certainty that bus, businessmen don't learn how to be businessmen in business school. I know less about medical school and it makes me very anxious. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 
I tried to persuade my daughter to, uh, instead of going to Medill School and getting a master's degree in telecommunications, to go work as an unpaid intern for a telecommunications company for a year because she'd come out ahead at the end and she, uh, and she would have uh, more money left. Uh, but she wouldn't have the credentials. So much of education now is about credentials. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk about uh, having majors in uh, parks and recreation or uh, law enforcement, are, are these people going to be better at running games or, or, or arresting uh, uh, speeders than if they hadn't taken those courses? I, maybe, maybe those areas are different from law school, but I, 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 I just am suspicious about it. And, uh, and, and I'm not suspicious about the liberal arts agenda because it's useless to begin with and who we're not, we have no pretense about it well if it's not a value in itself then it's not a value go ahead could, I, i'd like to sort of defend fred's question uh for a minute and actually i don't view it as political or present i don't view it as remotely a partisan question yes, but, no no oh, oh well, it's me don't is it, okay forget, okay forget but but i okay but but i do not view i i i i worry a little bit that this discussion is a bit of preaching to the choir yeah. and it, uh, of those who are somewhat self-selected to be in this room today. Um, and the problem, and I say this as somebody who uh, knows Pat McGuire a lot well and has immense respect for what she does at Trinity, is that I don't think your answer, as eloquent as much as it may convince me and everyone in this room, I don't think most governors, whether they be Democrat or Republican, are remotely convinced. And I, I base that on the policy decisions that I see across party lines. Now, to the answer of how can they do this when they know all this about uh, how, what produces future leaders, I think it's because most of them imagine their kids going to Williams. Um, they're not, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not sending their kids to the institutions from which they are cutting out philosophy. Um, now, whether they want their kids to major in philosophy, I have no idea. But, but, but by the choices that are being made about which programs get support and which universities get support, they are, I would say, across party lines, devaluing this kind of education. And here is where I think um, your point about the similarities between the research universities and liberal arts colleges, if you look at the impact of these, tra of these trends on what's going on to the ability to be a history major or philosophy major at a large state university are as great as those that Vic focuses on in his book. And we need to remember that a lot of people got excited about the liberal arts at, um, at a state university. Um, I also think the other point, Fred, Fred also made two other really important points about all the transfers and moving around. Part of the uniqueness of the liberal arts college experience, I would argue, is that there is a coherent vision for what is a Williams education or an Oberlin education or a Smith education or a Trinity education. When students are going to five or six colleges to get a bachelor's degree, um, you don't have that coherence. When your goal is to qualify to take a nursing exam, the nursing licensure exam, you can go to five or six colleges and get the, the necessary thing. So I actually think a lot of these trends, many of which are encouraged by public policy, um, do in fact suggest that either the policymakers haven't heard you or they're focused on other things. Could, can I just interject here? Let, and I am a historian, so let's go back to that moment that uh, I forget who, which of you talked about the, in the 50s. Really, it's really the post-war period. It's, it's World War II. It's the GI Bill when suddenly American colleges and universities opened up to a much wider range of students. And it was also, what, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this, maybe it was at that moment that the commitment to the liberal arts and to that idea of a four-year education that was based on a unified vision really began to erode. I mean, the colleges and universities were jammed shut, oh, jammed full at the end of the, uh, the 40s and 50s, and it did start taking longer than four years to get out, and so forth and so on. And so, um, and then this comes back to Stephen Shore's question, too. I mean, so more and more people were going to, you know, I mean, a liberal arts education was really for a very long time restricted to elites. That didn't, that's not to say that non-elites might not have benefited from it or were not qualified to participate in it, but that was, in fact, what, 
who who benefit who had access to it, and also their families um, could afford it. Not just the, not just the money, but the time to let them to take four years or whatever it was to, to go to college and then maybe go on and get a professional degree or whatever. So they didn't need them contributing to their family coffers all that time. The, po the population that started to go to college after the war didn't have that luxury. And they had to think about, and I think that's when the utilitarian notion of, of, a, co of a college education really began to, to, to take hold. And, you know, and, it's and, and when you have first generation college students going, and, and their parents are saying, you know, can we afford, not can we just afford the money, but can we afford to, you know, for you to take this time to do this? Is what, it worth it? Is it worth it? What's the payoff? What's the, what's the payoff going to be for us? So I don't know, I mean, how do you think about that? I mean, what's, you know, how, so how, I mean, can, I guess what I'm sort of saying is can the liberal arts, edu the vision of a liberal arts, edu four year liberal arts education, whether it's in a small school, a small college, or in a, within a university or whatever, can, is that a vision that really, suits, you know, is, is, is um, appropriate for, for large, I mean, if we're talking about class here, we're really talking about class, is that really appropriate? First, I mean, it would be nice if everybody could have that experience, but is it really practical? You sound like Rosenblatt. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I comment on sure. that? You know, uh, my folks, I, I grew up in, in Britain because my father got a job in England, that they were Irish, despite my name. They left school at 14. I think we have to be very careful stereotyping kids who were the first generation at college. We were the first generation at high school. My, my, uh, <laughs> and I don't remember uh, that. And I, I think there's a danger of imposing that set of views on, on people. Some of the first community colleges, my wife taught at one, and we're teaching wonderful liberal arts stuff, which disappeared later on. Um, and, and, you know, it was opening up for a lot of the, the, these kids a vision that they'd never thought about. So I, I, I worry uh, uh, about saying uh, that we can't assume that we're uh, or assuming that. New, first generation of college won't be interested in this. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there are a lot of pressures on those kids oh. coming from outside, from parents and even from themselves, you know, saying, do I have time to study poetry? Well, and you also, you have to look at the overall data. There, there are definitely examples of first generation students who go to any type of college or university, but on average, First generation students are much more likely to seek out a practical program. The reason MIT fought overlap is MIT had the highest, genera highest percentage of first generation students, higher than the Ivies. It mattered to them more to protect their financial aid system because first generation students who are engineering inclined love to become engineers. It's, it, 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 and, and it's not irrational if you are low income to want a job that's going to better your family. And I think when we look at, say, the current proposals to increase the percentage of students who have a degree, interestingly, um, Obama has not proposed a huge increase in the number of students who should earn bachelor's degrees, let alone liberal arts degrees. He's talking about some post-secondary. And so he's talking about a lot of first-generation people who will be much more likely to get a good job because they have a one-year certificate or a two-year community college degree. This is really a separate discussion in, for most students from the liberal arts discussion we're having. But I know this woman really wants yeah, to ask a question. Please jump in, yeah. Please use the mic. We're, we're not talking. Um, you all haven't addressed what I consider a major importance in this whole liberal arts uh, undergraduate problem, and that is the introduction of liberal arts, or the actually the elimination of certain parts of a liberal arts education from elementary and secondary education, so that. If you are no longer taken to the gallery to look at an example of quantism and then allowed to go back to your art class, to, you know, if you're not making that attractive and introducing that, then what is the desire amongst thousands of young people to uh, expand that? And how do you look to work with 
secondary and elementary level in order to encourage that feeder opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, clearly so many high school systems, the first thing they're cutting are things like oh, art. No. I think, I've been very involved in museums of one sort or another for years, but I, I th and, and museums have been in a great growth pattern and, uh, and visitation of museums. I, I think that there's a picking up of that particular charge uh, by entities that are not the schools themselves. I, I've been on the board of the Clark Art Institute in Williams, nothing to do with Williams, it's a separate entity and we allot very considerable amounts of money every year to free busing for students from schools to get them into the, into the collection and provide a curator to talk to them. But are they going back to the school to their own little no. easel well, in the fifth grade? By, by and large, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that way if they don't have teachers yeah. in it, they won't. Well, well and, and, and beyond, there's actually a sort of a corollary to the issue you raise, which is the requirements when they, once they get to college. The reason, you know, it is not shocking that enrollments drop in areas that you're not required to study. Um, and, 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 and at most non, at most liberal arts colleges that are focused on filling their classes, um, having a strenuous set of requirements is viewed as a negative, is viewed as something that will scare away students, not attract students. So you have this cycle where college doesn't require foreign language, then there are very few German majors, so then let's eliminate German, so then nobody studies German. And, and, and in a more, the, in a in previous generation, some number of the students forced to study German would have fallen in love with German, and that doesn't happen. I mean, this this actually leads to a, something a thought that I had as you were all talking, but especially Vic, and that is that when you have some colleges exceeding to the demands of the students, uh, they're giving up their own prerogatives. I mean, we, we were talking about the I think somebody was talking about the value of a degree, the value of getting a credential. If the institutions are no longer setting the, the criteria for getting that degree and acquiring that credential, then where does the authority, the authority lie? Where does the, you know, because the, it's the authority behind the credential that makes it valuable. And if someone's, if, if, if institutions are capitulating on that and it's the students who are setting the terms, uh, you know, then, then where, you know, how is the credential valued? What does it stand for anymore? Uh, a concluding thought? Yeah, well, wait, before you have that, before you conclude, I think, Frank, do you want to jump no, in? No, my, I wanted to go back to one of your yeah. questions. Ah, okay. not a so I don't want to thought. derail this. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, because I hope we'll stay around and, and talk after we finish. And but books are also available for sale. Are they? Wonder yes, oh, wonderful. Yes. And, uh, there's, but, uh, and there's wine and cheese to, but, uh, but to I'd, converse I'd, over. The book talks about liberal arts colleges because uh, it's there and you can measure it and you can deal with it. But the title is liberal arts, not liberal arts colleges at the brink. The colleges are not going to go under, they're going to change. And the question is, what becomes of liberal arts at the community college, at the university, anywhere? And uh, it's very hard to, to make a case for why you should be concerned about it. It's never been a part of your life. I, I understand that. But uh, I am, and uh, it's not something I've devoted a lot of this afternoon to talking about, but I, I believe that studying for the sake of studying, for the sake of using your mind, for the sake of, of, of acquiring the skill of wanting to know and learning how to know is of great value. And, and the one thing that gets in the way of that more than anything else is studying something that you care about, like how to repair a car. If you study how to repair a car, you, you're going to learn how to repair a car. The nice thing about anthropology or philosophy or, or English literature is you, you'll learn about them, but that's not why you're there. You're there for the act of learning, not for the acquiring. And I, I, I hope you'll read this book thinking about it as a, a, a peon in, 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 in support of liberal arts, not of liberal arts colleges. That's what I would say.